Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second GLF Live, a new series from Landscape News and the Global Landscapes Forum of live interviews with experts on COVID-19 and various aspects as it relates to the environment and climate change. So today we're going to be hearing from two leading scientists on the spread of zoonotic diseases, Kate Jones and Thomas Gillespie. And to start, zoonotic diseases are infectious diseases that jump from non-human animals to, to, to humans. So the epidemic at hand falls into this category. So we're very happy to have with us here today, Kate Jones, who is the chair of ecology and biology at University College London, whose award-winning research on biodiversity modeling has included all sorts of studies um, looking at the spread of different coronaviruses and she has one that looked at no less than 335 emerging infect infectious diseases over the course of 65 years. So she really knows a lot on this subject. And we have Thomas Gillespie, who's joining us from Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, although he's currently in Mississippi. <laughs> yeah. where he is an associate professor, and he runs the Gillespie Lab, which looks at how the way humans use and change tropical forests can cause disease transmission. He's also a National Geographic Explorer and a fellow with the US Environmental Protection Agency. And he works with Jane Goodall on an ecosystem health project in the Gombe region of Tanzania. So thank you, Thomas and Kate, for making the time to share your expertise with us today. Pleasure, it's great to be here. Thank you. So Kate, I'll start with you. What was your reaction and your level of surprise or lack thereof when you first heard about the outbreak in Wuhan? I think it's a, a really good question. Um, I think uh, my colleagues and I have been expecting something like this to happen for many years. And um, in 2018, for example, 2018, the UN kind of designated a known unknown as disease X. So disease X was, is, is something like COVID, but it's kind of, it goes um, airborne and it's got a higher case fatality rate than the one that we have. So in some respects, we've been expecting this to happen. And the US, for example, has or did put in a lot of um, uh, resources into uh, pandemic preparedness. And in the UK, for example, pandemic flu is recognized as one of the highest risks on our risk register. So the, the world should have been slightly more prepared <laughs> than it was <laughs> for this outbreak. So I, I don't think we're surprised. And I also think that we've known about coronaviruses um, and their potential for jumping into the human population for many years. And we've also known that bats in particular, although coronaviruses are all through the animal kingdom, bats in particular host a quite a, a lot of diversity of the coronaviruses. So it's uh, this is my unsurprised face. <laughs> Thomas, would you like to comment? Right, I mean, you've, you've hit it on the head. It's <laughs> absolutely expected. And if anything, we're lucky that this has been the kind of trial run. Yeah, it's like a shot across the bow because it's uh, harder to spread than disease X, for example. And also the case fatality rate is, is high. And I'm not trying to dismiss that, but it could have been much higher. <laughs> Uh, so it could have been uh, much worse than it currently is. I know that so helped the people who've actually got it and, had, and lost people from it, but it could have been much worse. Mm -hmm. So the fact that it is a SARS coronavirus specifically rather than an, a different emerging infectious disease is in some ways a benefit to this, quote, trial run. What do you mean exactly? Um, so in relation to your research on other emerging infectious diseases, what are some examples of ones that might have been worse? That... Um, if we'd had an Ebola-like disease, that's the case fatality rate in some regions is up to 70%, 80% in some areas, you know, can be, quite, can be much lower. But um, that spread through uh, body fluids and close contact. Uh, but if that had been airborne, uh, that would have been really bad. <laughs> and that's not a coronavirus. That's a henipavirus, I think. Yeah. Mm. I think it is. 
So this one came through the wet market, so Wuhan. As oh, we don't as know that, actually. Is. Yeah, we don't know that, um, but there is talk of that. And wet markets, while they are very necessary for food and livelihoods, they pose a lot of dangers and the spread of diseases. So, Thomas, what can be done to reduce the risks of wet markets? I mean, again, the, the issue of whether or not wet markets as they exist are necessary is kind of the core of this. Um, you know, we need, we need a diverse, nourishing diet. And how we go about that as human populations grow uh, requires changes in how we consider what should and should, be, should, should, and should not be on the table as options. Um, and so many of, the, many of the aspects of the wet market are illegal even by the laws of the countries where they exist. Um, there are species that are endangered, that are, that are being sold, that are on the menu. Um, and this overall focus of having a tremendous amount of diversity within these markets is what's creating the greatest challenges. It's the density of the organisms and the diversity of, of what's there that's creating a perfect storm for these types of spillover events. Um, Kate, if you want to add. Yeah, I was just going to, I completely agree with you. I was just going to add that, you know, it'd be really interesting to figure out what the, what the relative contribution is of these wet markets versus just deforestation in general. And also intensification of agriculture, where you've got lots and lots of livestock, very similarly genetically related livestock in vast quantities and also quite near wild species. And so, you know, we know that quite a few outbreaks of uh, zoonotic pathogens that have been harmful to us have come from uh, via an intermediate host through livestock. So actually, so banning wet markets or even increasing the biosecurity of wet markets may have some effect but actually the issues are very complex they're about how we've degraded landscapes how we've intensified livestock production in areas we've never seen before and also there's so many of us so that yeah. the interfaces are like more frequent so like and then when when something spills over uh, the chances of it going into a highly dense area are much greater because there's so many more of us spread out across the world. And then we've got massive transport networks. And so like a spillover, so the spillover of Ebola in, in West Africa, that, that went completely ballistic because it was in a dense area and also spread across the region because of really good tra transport links. So it's a really complex a complex uh, system, and I I don't know how uh, wet markets fit into that at the moment. I don't think anybody does. Mm -hmm. But our, our sense, I would say collectively, is that getting rid of wet markets alone will not solve the problem. Um, yeah. It's about landscape conservation and protection as well. That's the that's dominant issue. The dominant issue is choices in land use, I would say, primarily in biodiverse realms. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'll get back to that in a minute. But first, in terms of transmission and the spread of diseases, we've seen a lot of outbreaks in Europe and North America and the global north. How does this relate to land use changes and species richness in the tropics and along the equator? Perhaps, Thomas, this goes to you or Kate, as you wish. So I mean, there, are, there are many. I'll, I'll start and then Kate will come in. <laughs> we're, we're both very eager to talk about this. This is this is core, right? Um, I mean, the, the issues are that we we promote a lot of activities that um, that that cause dramatic shifts in land use in the tropics. Um, these are systems that have the highest biodiversity in the world. Um, and these are the places where the species closely related to us, um, primates uh, most closely related to us, but not as biodiverse, and then species that are slightly less related to us, but still very, very close in terms of being able to transfer disease like bats and rodents are very speciose. And so, you know, half of the mammalian species in the world are rodents, a quarter are bats, and you go into these tropical systems and you actually have half 
of the biodiversity of uh, mammalian biodiversity in some of these systems made up of bats. And we've heard from Peyton and others about the importance of bats, the uniqueness of bats as potential species for spillover. Um, all of these factors play a role in this. And then when we, it's not that nature is, you know, attacking us. It's, it's that when we disturb these highly diverse systems, there are gonna be unintended consequences. Uh, we're going to alter the ecology of those organisms. Uh, they're going to try to find a way to survive. And as they look for food, as their food resources are gone, or other aspects of their niche, uh, that can lead to novel types of interaction with humans and, and spillover. Kate? Um, I think you said it really, but um, I guess I would add that I don't think it's about biodiversity per se. I don't think it's about uh, let's cut down this forest and, and reduce the number of species and then somehow uh, that means that diseases are more likely to jump to us. I think it's about how we're altering the communities that are in those forests and so um, we're making them more simple and we're also favouring species which may be able to survive those degraded landscapes better and perhaps invest less in immunity and or have some special features which enable them to survive and therefore our risk of getting something from them is higher so that can happen in the tropics or in a lovely landscape in new england right with lyme's disease for example so it doesn't it doesn't matter particularly that it's the tropics or the north it's about degrading systems and making them simpler um, i think the risk is higher in the tropics just because there's just so many more species and all species have their own pathogens and so you know there are more pathogens to to make that jump and perhaps ones that we have not seen before and we don't have any immunity to so i think it's about not it's not just a simple link between ch cutting down a forest and you get ebola it's about how you alter those systems and you know, degraded landscapes could actually be better for not getting a disease because if you, if you think about a city, um, you've got better healthcare and you've got systems which would fill in lakes and ponds so you didn't get mosquitoes. So it's a really complex system that we're only just trying to get a grips with. And there's been like a massive debate in the literature about losing biodiversity and and the relationship between disease emergence and it's, it's called the dilution effect or the amplification effect and people have been rowing about this for years and it's just been complete distraction <laughs> to the yeah. actual point which is about not about biodiversity but it's about what we're doing to the ecosystems which are present when you degrade landscapes yeah and so it's, it's, it. <laughs> no, it's the key it's it's about the disruption of the community of organisms, and uh, and yeah, the probability of that of of something novel occurring is more likely in a tropical system where you have greater diversity. But uh, it can happen anywhere, anywhere that we're disrupting the system, the community, and the interactions between species. Mm. How long has this debate been going on in the scientific community about dilution or amplification or other theories around this? about 10 years probably thomas it's really it's the the fervor has really taken off in like the last i'd say the debate has been going on since the for about 20 years we had these initial examples with lyme disease of this phenomena um and, and then people initially were just talking about vector-borne systems so vector-borne disease so it's and sex transmitting diseases like malaria for example yeah. So then there was then there was a shift to well, this probably works for everything, and there's probably this relationship between biodiversity and um, and disease where dilution is a primary factor. And then amplification effect came in as an alternative to that, which was simply you know some of these things relate to frequency dependent versus density dependent diseases. They relate to scaling of body size and potential host and and potential for amplification and actually demographic and eco ecological factors related to the 
species and communities at play. So it's, it's that you've got to go beyond that simple construct of biodiversity, good, disease, bad, and get into the details. And what you find is that it's very complex, but uh, maintaining systems is, is often our best approach. And when we disrupt them, there will be consequences. And sometimes we can predict them, but sometimes our predictive capacity is only about 30%. So would you take an umbrella out if it's a 30% chance of rain? You know, we've got <laughs> the protect, you know, there, there are these kinds of things we've got to consider. I think we, we've been very reductionist in the way that we've been thinking about it. And it's a systems dynamic process. I mean, it's very complicated. It's a wicked problem. And I think that in order to move us from where we are to predict prediction, we need to get a much better handle on what those interactions are. And I say systems dynamic because all of the all the things which are interacting, say forest deforestation, uh, the switching communities, happen with everything else changing as well. So the climate changes. So what does that do to the host? What does that do to the humans? The socioeconomic change, um, view changes. We all sit in our homes. So like all of these things change and change every single aspect of that. And so in order to make predictive models, they've got to be much more process driven, I think, and much more complex. So I think we're, we're getting there. And I also think, I just have a slight rant, but I also think that the public health community need to take this more seriously. So they need to include ecologists, actual ecologists, in when they're debating and talking about the public health aspects of disease, infectious diseases, and also more generally across the whole piece of ecosystem services, services that are prov provided by nature. Like the public health community do not think about this, they don't think about ecology, they think about climate change just recently, about health and climate change, but this is much more fundamental. It's about land use change and how land use change impacts human health. And I think we've got to have a much more cohesive and engaged conversation with the public health communities. That's my rant. <laughs> Do you see this happening in any capacity yet? Or with the past 10 to 20 years of this debate emerging in the scientific community, are there any efforts that are working successfully right now? Well, I would say that there are reasons to be cheerful because there's the One Health movement, which has been going on uh, for a number of years, but that was a conversation largely from the medics and from the vets and didn't really involve the ecologists. Could you briefly define the One Health movement in case some listeners don't know? Uh, One Health is like there are, it's a unifying policy, multidisciplinary policy um, instrument so that people can think about uh, animal and plant health as well as human health. And typically this was to do with crops and livestock and, and human health. But more latterly, it's become a bit more uh, broader in terms of thinking about ecosystem health. And there's new terms like planetary health. So planetary health trying to link those two things. And also, and I think this has been a real push, is the sustainable development goals. So I think the sustainable yeah. development goals have really made the global health community take notice of ecology and these complex systems because they've suddenly had a whole bunch of SDGs that they didn't know existed apart from malaria, TB and HIV, you know, they were like, oh no, we've got to actually think about all these other things. <laughs> so, I don't know, and there's reasons to be cheerful, definitely. Thomas, do you think One Health or any other efforts that you've seen are going to be amplified after or during or after this epidemic uh, dies down a bit going forward? Do you think this is going to be used to give them more traction? Yeah, I mean, I think, Kate's right that uh, we've had these terms, but they've typically been used to rally a, a small part of the overall community that needs to be involved um, with a predominance to one of those groups. And typically at the exception of ecology, where ecology has been kind of brought in after the fact, or you know, we're brought in as someone kind of on the side. Yeah, um, it's weird. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's something where 
a lot more traction can happen. Having this happen in relation to the sustainable development goals really is the ideal way because it helps us to really unify beyond, behind what the real challenges are, the complexity, not trying to just focus on one, one component of that. And I think that also relates to getting people on the climate change side of things to also open, you know, take the visor, you know, the, the, the blinds off and realize that the issues are far broader. Climate is one small part of a very big dynamic. And once we stop talking climate change constantly and start talking about the interface between humans and the natural world in all ways, uh, with land use being this very dominant paradigm that's at play now in a very strong way and climate being a component of this, then we'll, we'll get to solutions. I, I think the, the public health people, the global health people, have been a very, for me personally, a very hard nut to crack. So they are uh, a whole community on their own and they talk to each other and they do, they very they do like look you know talk and, and think to each other, and they publish in the different journals, and it's just very difficult to to get into that community. And in some ways, the ecology conservation community and the public health community have been at odds for since the beginning, really, because I don't know whether you knew this, but the the uh, in the fifties the U.S. sprayed DDT. Uh, indiscriminately to kill mosquitoes to stop the spread of malaria and they managed to eradicate malaria from the US and that saved millions of lives but it also had severe consequences on wildlife populations and it increased disease resistance to DDT and you know subsequently you know you had to get different ta tactics to deal with malaria and that's, that prompted Rachel Carson to write Silent Spring. And that started, well, or rallied the huge environmental movement. So like, <laughs> we are kind of strange bedfellows in a way, but it, we need to somehow break down those silos and that history to start really engaging more fundamentally. Like even the word ecological analysis in the public health community means a really rubbish, uh, study. That's what that word means in the public health community. It means like a study that has no correlation and no process mechanisms at all. That's what it means. How and insulting! A, and a big, I'm insulted! And a big part of this is that these communities are still very siloed. As much as we talk about interdisciplinary, they're siloing because of terminology and because of these types of challenges where you know, groups are speaking different languages and they want to have a hierarchy of some sort. And it's fighting those hierarchies that form uh, is a big part of the solution to these things. There was a, um, an op-ed by Richard Horton, who's the editor of The Lancet, and he's, um, he's a very interesting character and he, he tries to push the boundaries quite a lot. And um, he wrote, he's been very big on climate change and health and they, they had a whole commission, Lancet Commission, which is a big uh, issue of the Lancet, which is the biggest health journal in the world. And uh, in this issue, I just saw it last year, he goes, um, you know, climate change is the, the thing of our time and it, it's embedded in the public health community. But actually biodiversity is really important. And I was like, oh my God. Oh my God, he's actually said the word quiet. <laughs> There's hope. It's like, yeah. this, this like ray of sunlight hit me. I was like, oh my God, the editor of The Lancet agrees with me. <laughs> anyway, that was, I think it's the start, you know, it's the start. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it's the start that we'll see pick up more as this continues. And switching gears to that, as we do approach um, the last portion of our conversation, how far do we have to go with this, do you think? And what regions of the world, what do you expect from them in the South or elsewhere? What else can we expect to see in the remainder of this year and beyond, if you had to make an educated guess? <laughs> so we're, I, I, I wear a lot of different hats um, in terms of my role in different things. And so I, I coordinate 
a number of projects that kind of look at this zoonotic interface um, and land use change in, in the South. Uh, so big projects in Tanzania, um, Uganda, uh, and Madagascar. And in Madagascar, I'm also on the board of directors of uh, an NGO uh, that's incubated by Partners in Health. Uh, it's called Pivots. So it's a health system strengthening NGO. So we're trying to help prepare a district within Madagascar for this pandemic and assist the government of Madagascar as we can. And it's tremendously challenging. Um, we know of all the challenges that we're having in developed countries to deal with this. Um, the, the lack of uh, options for clinical care, you know, supportive care is the norm. Uh, we don't have ventilators in Madagascar. Um, so we're struggling to kind of work through what we do without access to some of these things. One of the benefits that we have in these places is that they don't have the road networks. They don't have the level of human density in Madagascar that we have in, in many other systems that are, that are challenging. So there are some advantages to remoteness, to lack of connectivity, um, but then the challenge can also be getting education out in terms of how to protect yourself, um, how to social distance and, and so on. So we're working very quickly on a lot of these issues knowing we have a very small time window. Um, and we're doing the same for the, the wild primates that we work with because many of them have been habituated for uh, tourism and research and they're uh, likely very susceptible to this virus as well, um, especially the great apes. So uh, we're in most of these uh, cases, we're focused on how do we reduce the risk of initial exposure because we don't have a, the same options for intervention after. Mm -hmm. Do you have any examples of, of how do we uh, reduce the initial risk so we never get to the stage of afterwards? So, um, I mean, with, the, with, with Gombe, for example, in Tanzania, where Jane Goodall uh, initiated her work 60 years ago, um, you know, we've been working with the government of Tanzania to reduce human contact with the chimpanzees and the baboons um, and the vervet monkeys in that system. All of those terrestrial primates are the ones at greatest risk because of the contamination issue. So in those in, in the Gombe system, we're reducing the number of people on site to just essential staff. Uh, we're reducing, there typically have been uh, passenger boats that stop at the park daily multiple times. Those have been uh, rerouted to not contact the park. Uh, foot trails have been closed down by the park authorities. Um, so many of these actions are being taken. And then we're, we're only having uh, essential staff patrol the boundaries for uh, control of illegal activities instead of being close to the, the wildlife as they normally would be to monitor them for health or behavioral research. Mm. What would happen if this does hit the great apes? What would you expect to see? I mean, with uh, past uh, infections of paramyxoviruses that tend to cause a common cold in people, we've seen mortality rates of almost 20% uh, in wild chimpanzees. We've seen 10% mortality in wild gorillas. Um, we've had only one case before of a coronavirus in wild apes that we know of. It was a very mild form uh, in humans, and it resulted in more severe uh, disease in the chimps, but fortunately it didn't cause death in that case. But we expect habituated uh, apes to be the ones most likely to become infected, the ones that we have gotten used to human presence that aren't afraid of people. And so they're the ambassadors for their species. They're the, the, the individuals that get seen and, and that we learn from. Uh, they're the ones that we would likely see a lot of mortality in. And then the question of how well that would spread into the populations uh, in those areas, the wild uh, individuals that live in proximity relates to the group structures of the different apes. Each species has a different way of interacting with others of their species. And so some of them are gonna have higher risk of transmission into the wild population than others. 
But fortunately, at least for them, they're at lower density than than us in all in all forms, and so their their risk of sort of it burning through the way it's burned through human populations is a lot lower. Hmm. I'll put this last question to you both before we go to audience questions. But what have you learned from this? From this pandemic? Yes. I learned from this. Uh, our lack of preparedness and, you know, the, the any link that's weak is a weak link for the entire planet. And that's, you know, we really do need to think more globally together about addressing these kinds of risks. And, you know, there's been a call for universal health care many years from the UN. And, you know, things like that are really important when you've got such a, um, a thing that sweeps through nations without any, uh, you know, it doesn't care who you are, what colour you are, doesn't care or how rich you are. But it does matter to us about that everybody's covered and has enough resources and has enough health care and they can stay home when they need to and they can afford to do that. So to me, it kind of illustrates that we can't go on as we are and we also can't go on exploiting the natural world as if it's infinite, it's finite and there are consequences to our actions. And so maybe it's time for a reassessment of, of how we treat each other and how we treat the planet. Thank you. Yeah, I think Kate, Kate's really dealt with that question well um, and covered the, the core of it. Um, when we think about altering landscapes, we need to consider the negative externality of potential spillover. Um, when we decide it's okay to put, you know, this, this monoculture plantation in or this farm of 50,000 pigs, we need to assess what's the risk of spillover. I mean, we actually have quite a bit of data to be able to integrate that into, uh, into the decision-making process where many things that have moved forward would not move forward. So we're often now asking, what can we do to mitigate this threat now that we have these, these potential threats? And step one is don't, don't continue in that direction where we have clear evidence that that will probably lead to this. I think the real issue is aligning uh, the stakeholders behind this. So currently, those who are benefiting and profiting from some of these transitions are not the ones paying the costs. Uh, and so we need to we need to align the stakeholders to address that core issue. And I think the the other great news is that many of the solutions for reducing the risk of pandemics caused by zoonotic spillover are similar to the ways that you would mitigate uh, issues of climate change and other issues of us living out of balance with nature. And so kind of aligning these factors uh, is key. And we're feeling the urgency now that we haven't felt with climate change. And the key to that is we're feeling the vulnerability. We're seeing how this affects our lives, our loved ones, our economies. And I think that the key issue is when people are feeling that vulnerability and recognizing the urgency, we have to act. Um, I think somebody, uh, it's not my thought, but somebody was telling me about the relationship between climate change and land use change. And uh, they were saying climate change is like you've got a, a lovely house, beach house, it's on the edge of a cliff. And it's, you know, it's definitely going to fall in to the sea eventually but land use change is like it's also on fire <laughs> we've yeah. got to deal with the land use change and the impacts on our ecosystems as well as dealing with climate change so i, I think the you know the focus on climate change is important obviously but i think more urgent is our treatment and our use of the landscape mm -hmm. yeah that's a very important distinction and i really like that analogy thank you um, a question from the audience going back to the discussion earlier about including more ecologists and discussion about biodiversity in the health conversations. Uh, someone, someone is asking, um, this is Abraham Ngu, 
I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, if you think institutionally, it's feasible to break down the barriers between these communities. And what are some examples of what this might look like? Yeah, it is really difficult. Um, I think there's been a lack of, it's not just the public health people that's the problem. I think it's the ecologists as well. So the ecologists have focused on ecosystem services, like services which are provided by nature to us. And they've not made direct links to human health, or very rarely do. And so it's the ecologist's fault as well as the, as the public health people. And having that evidence base is what the public health people are really interested in. And we haven't provided as ecologists. So I think there needs to be a lot more evidence for them to, to act. And, and they have their own systems of understanding evidence. Uh, like randomized controlled trials, for example, they would want to see a randomized controlled trial about this, or um, you know, they want to see the evidence that there is a direct link. But direct links are incredibly difficult when you have ecosystems which are just like this, you know, and you need to understand how those interactions and those complexities work. So I think um, an example, a good example, could be Planetary Health, which has come out of London School of Hygiene, Tropical Medicine. Um, and they've got a whole new journal, Lancet Planetary Health, which is starting to address some of these things. T Thomas, do you? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And I would also say structurally, we need to think about sort of the intergovernmental science policy panels, right? What are they focused around? We focus yeah. on climate, we yeah. focus on ecosystem <laughs> services. And then when you look at the experts who are engaged, they're in these silos separate from one another and we've left out critical interfaces that relate to where disease would play a role in this and so it hasn't got a home it hasn't got a home like zoonotic it, disease hasn't got an academic home there are some strange ecologists like me and thomas who yeah. think about it right who think about it and talk to some health people and these health people are like who are they i have no idea it's strange weird people and then you've got all these this right. who who study disease ecology but in animals and then you've got all the health people who study disease in humans and very few people that study this interface and we've we've effectively kept environmental policy and health policy as extremely distinct and that's our hugest failure we have to integrate those we have to integrate funding streams for those as well because the work that kate does the work that i do we're in that that limbo in between where, you know, there should be huge synergy toward work in this area and uh, discussion and policy. And that has to happen ideally from the intergovernmental intergovern science policy panels and stream down within each nation in terms of how we're funding science and how we're uh, moving forward on these things. Like, I had a proposal that was uh, about zoonotic interface and it went to the, you know, no names, no pack grill, but um, it went to a funding agency who said, uh, this is disease, so it needs to go into the, uh, you know, the funding agency that does disease. And then, so we, we sent it into the disease people. <laughs> this is ecology, so we don't fund that. <laughs> and that, that happens to us every year. You know, there's, there's case after case after case of that. Um, and it's it's part of why there's been a very slow progression toward solutions. So, you know, there are a few of us like Kate and I who are, you know, really dedicated to this. And we're volunteering our time to help push this in the right direction. But it's we have to we have to focus the emphasis on this um, as, as a critical component um, equal to climate change. Not, uh, not something that we should also consider as a secondary factor. Mm -hmm. There definitely needs to be more conversation around that. Another question from Dr. Wayne Boardman of the University of Adelaide. He's wondering if you have any feel for why there appears to be varied mortality rates for this epidemic in different countries apart from healthcare provisions and uh, conditions within the countries. For example, localized mutations, if your research on the spread of diseases um, can speak to that. 
I think it's pretty, probably, probably too early to say uh, to a large extent because you've got lags in the system of reporting so that you could have had been infected three weeks ago and only now reporting the deaths. So I think it's actually quite difficult to do comparisons at the moment and also testing numbers have been different. So I would um, I'd probably wait until we kind of understand and have more data in. I don't know, Thomas, if you got any other comments on that? Uh, well, first of all, hi, Wayne. Uh, good to have you here. Uh, I, I mean, I, I agree that it's it's early to, to know. The Most of the data is not in yet. Another issue is that the mortality rates, you know, they really depend on the denominator. And we're dealing with a very uncertain denominator on all fronts because of challenges with testing um, and uh, and also issues of who's actually included in, in, in the numerator as well. So are they individuals who specifically died of this virus or who had this virus and died of other complications, um, uh, et cetera. So are we, you know, taking all those things into account. In terms of mutations and different strains, I don't, I don't know enough about uh, kind of where we're at with that to, to comment. Um, one more question. This comes from a scientist and systems agronomist at CIMIT. Um, and he's asking about the, um, the balance between land sparing and cutting people from ecosystem disservices like pathogen spillover. And then also the balance with that with ecosystem services and allowing people to still um, move off the land and all the soil fertility, pest control, pollination, all the things that come along with ecosystem. It's an incredibly interesting question. Um, I don't know, to be honest, but I think that land sparing uh, is probably worse in terms of uh, risk because of the species that you get in a land than a dominated landscape. I think land sharing, if you do it at low density, would be better. That's just my opinion. But given what I know about zoonotic transfer, that's probably, for zoonotic transfer, that's probably true. Uh, whether it's true for other ecosystem services remains to be understood. Uh, Thomas, is there anything you would like to add on that or no? No, I mean, it, this scale is very important. Um, so kind of thinking, if you're talking about very localized or regional scale, you can have different outcomes, but uh, I'd agree with Kate on that. Mm -hmm. And then um, I'll end on this one. During the course of this conversation, we put a poll to the audience as to whether or not this is our new normal. Yeah. Is this? Uh, the audience said yes, but what do you guys think? living with epidemics such as this? Um, I hope not. <laughs> I'm really bored. <laughs> Although I have a very nice garden. You can hear the bird. Um, <laughs> I would say it doesn't have to be our new normal. That's the key. But we have to make some big changes in how we, how we look at our relationship with nature. We have to start doing risk assessments for land use change that include spillover as not a negative externality, but part of the equation. And we have to stop siloing uh, ecosystem over here and health over here. We have to have that dialogue at all levels from the intergovernmental panels to what's happening within each nation state. And we need we need multilateral activity, we need bilateral activity, we need to be doing it all at this interface. And this pandemic gives us the, the sense of urgency and the understanding of how vulnerable we are. And we, we need to act on it now. Great, well, this conversation was a great start, I hope. <laughs> and thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thomas and Kate for joining and thank you for all the audience for sticking with us. This was a great conversation and really valuable in so many ways. And tomorrow night we'll have our next GLF live. Uh, tomorrow night, Central European summertime, morning for North Americans. Um, and that will be with author and thinker Otto Sharmer. And then next week we have an interview with a doctor at Harvard on climate change 
And in the weeks to come, we have more focused conversations on food and deforestation and more. So check out more GLF Lives and we hope to see you all back soon. And thank you again, Thomas and Kate. Thank you. <laughs> Stay well, everyone. Yeah, stay well. <laughs>